Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available in our archives for you to watch later at your convenience. Uh, and I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives. Uh, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in um, any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. For those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here in Nebraska, which is similar to your state library. So we provide services and resources and training and grants to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, um, corrections, museums, archives, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, um, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on and do presentations for us, and we have guest speakers that come on. And today we have a little of both of that. <laughs> uh, it is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Yay! <laughs> Uh, that is when our technology innovation librarian, Amanda Sweet, comes on. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. Yeah, and she talks about something techie related. Um, we do have other tech related shows throughout the month too, um, as well, uh, depending on our topics that come up. Um, but you they can always guarantee matter. they don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> you can always guarantee that Amanda will be here on the last Wednesday of the month to, with something like that. Um, and today she is invited on um, our colleague, Brian, who's going to talk about shaping the libraries of the future and what he does. But um, I will hand it over to you, Amanda, to talk about um, uh, what we're doing today and what you and Brian do together, and then Brian to do uh, his presentation. So take it away. So I met Brian many moons ago. I can't remember if it was, I think it was computers and libraries that we met the first yeah, time. I think that's right, computers and libraries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I saw he was doing cool stuff, and he had he brought like shiny robots to entice me, and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely the way to get get Amanda's attention. <laughs> One of the ways. So, event like over the years, we wound up doing the games and gadgets um, together. So we're actually doing that again next month. So that'll be cool. It's coming up next month. Yes, computers and libraries. Highly recommend that conference. Um, it, in uh, Washington, D.C. area. Um, Nebraska Libraries, if you're looking to go, we currently have a discount rate for that. Check out our website for um, how you can um, get help with attending that. Yeah. Anyway, robots. So we were playing with robots, and then I found out that he did like a whole bunch of other stuff. And I asked him to help with the tech kits that we do here in the library commission because he is the one who tracks all the tech trends. And I was too lazy to do it myself. So I borrowed all of his tech trends and he helped me pick out like a whole bunch of different robotics, drones, and all these different kits. And it also helped that he also had them on hand so I could play with them and robots. So after that, I was like, what else do you do? And then I found out he did all this strategy stuff. He helped with um, AI, VR. You can talk about it later. You do right. stuff. And that's what this session is all about because Brian does stuff. Cool. Yeah, no, thanks, Amanda. And yeah, uh, I think you do a wonderful job with your tech kits. Uh, not many consortiums of any kind, I think, have that many plethora of games, gadgets, and gizmos that are available for circulation. So kudos to you putting all that together. And uh, for those that are watching and you aren't sure what those things are, I would highly encourage you to check those out. Uh, there's a variety of cool circulation and curriculum that Amanda has developed over the years. 
this uh, is something that we've done over the years a lot at the library commission it's just something um as far as like helping libraries get a taste of what they could do without them having to buy it themselves um, before this, we had our, um, our Makerspace grant where we gave libraries a set of Makerspace equipment that went temporarily in their library to get them to learn about that. Years before that, we had um, we did gaming in libraries, gaming equipment. We bought a PlayStation and oh, wow. Dance Dance Revolution and Rock Band, and we showed libraries how to use that with a couple of workshops we did. So um, that's something we've got a history of here, and Amanda's continuing that now with all the tech kids. Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about like where I came from and like what sparked my passion in the library world uh, as well as, so I always like to show people like how I run the Evolve project because I want everyone else to do the same thing I do. Like I'm not in it for, you know, riches and glory. Uh, I think the process that I put together for the Evolve project is repeatable for anybody. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, a little bit about that today. So. Uh, I'm, I apologize if I don't mute fast enough. I am like under the weather. And so if I start gagging or coughing, just know that I'm probably alive. Uh, and I just rehashed up some tea or re-boiled some water for some tea. So I should, I should hang in there. So found some baby photos of me in the library world uh, that my library I used to work at posted without my I can send, I'd say that jokingly because like, I don't need photos of my baby picture all over the internet. People make fun of me enough. Uh, and so here's some more ammo. And if you can figure out which one's me, you win a prize of a good feeling inside. So uh, my parents would bring me to every single library event that our local library hosted. We were in walking distance to the library. So naturally we were there every day, uh, either to check out books, compete in the summer reading program and things like that. Are Any you guesses yellow? to which child I'm, I am? <clears throat> Are you in yellow on the left? Uh, I am. And, and are you blue on the right? No, I guess it's, it's like a multicolor shirt. I'm, be, I'm behind my brother that's oh, dressing okay. like a sailor, I guess, with the red and pinstripe <laughs> shorts. That's my little brother. So yeah, we were we were at the library quite frequently. Uh, oops, next slide. More baby photos. Uh, I don't know what I'm excited about, but I'm the bottom right there. Uh, and then I am less excited on the other picture as well, probably because my brother was clinging on to me because he's needy. I hope he watches this recording. I'll probably send it to him. We'll have a couple laughs. But uh, every single event that our local library hosted, I'm pretty sure I was in attendance. And so there's probably thousands more photos of me somewhere in somebody's camera roll. So 1994, if it shows my age, uh, is the one on the left, uh, baby Brian, and then slightly less baby Brian, but still a baby on the right wearing, I think that was a Menard shirt, um, MFG, I don't know what the F stood for, but uh, so yeah, that was, that was my upbringing. And so when I turned 16, my parents were like, you should get a job. And I was like, ew, gross. But luckily my parents already told the library that I was willing to work there because I like computers and I was lied to because my first jobs at the library was nothing to do with computers. Instead, they made me dress up uh, and go to a variety of different events. And so we did, uh, every Halloween, we had something called a haunted trail. And uh, our library had like a booth, if you will, on this forest preserve. And we would dress up as pirates, leprechauns. Uh, what else would we do? We had a whole bunch of different themes. Um, and so we had to constantly dress up. And I was kind of like, you know, I was like, I hope none of my high school friends do these things because I'll never live this down. <laughs> what are you talking about? Pirate Brian is awesome. Uh -huh. I had longer hair back then as well, as you can see, with my luscious locks. <laughs> uh, we even ran, I even got to run programs in the library space. So I did guitar and puppetry and everything else. Uh, and then finally I got into computers when I was 18 years old. Uh, I was the director of IT for the library system. Uh, and so, but that was my upbringing. I was always involved in the library, whether from the patron perspective or from the, uh, I don't know, putting on the programs and events. And so I learned that there was heights within the library space. Like we were super, super busy during the summer reading program and not so busy everywhere else. Uh, and so I questioned, like, why is that? Why, why don't we always have the same amount of traffic that we do in the summertime versus during the school year? 
uh, or in the middle middle of winter. Well, there's nothing else to do when it's snowing and cold outside here in Chicago, Illinois. So go to the library. It's warm. They got coffee. It's free. Hot cocoa. It's free. Uh, but we always had a dip in usage. And so uh, if you're familiar with the Pew Research, they do a bunch of uh, surveys and data collections and gatherings. Uh, and so I saw this slide deck. I was I went to my first library conference, which was computers and libraries. I was 21 or 22. And my library director forced me to go to this library conference. And I told her, look, I don't travel, I'm still in college. I, don't, I can't take off a week to learn. And I have nothing in common with librarians. I don't read books. And she's like, <laughs> no, Brian, you're going to this library conference. And her name was Phyllis Jacobic. And so after much, much arguing, she convinced me to go because she's like, we'll give you a stipend. You, get, you can go eat food there, learn a whole bunch of stuff and come back with new ideas. And I was like, okay, fine. If I don't have to pay for it, I guess it's, it's really not that scary to go on a plane for the first time by myself uh, and go to another state that I've never been to. I've only been to like local touching states, really. Um, so panic and scared i got there learned a whole bunch and right before then that was like the before people started talking about uh maker spaces and so i was bewildered by all the really cool things that people were doing and thinking about doing eventually and i was like well i'm a tech nerd so i can do all these like i can implement this pretty quickly but the slide that i saw from lee rainey and the P P research foundation was this one where 53% of the people said they used the library in the last 12 months, but 91% say it was important. So why on earth are we missing 38% of those patrons? Like if, it, if it's really that important, they should have at least used it within the last 12 months. And that's like a bare minimum. Uh, and so I posed a question to my, one of my colleagues, Dave Hesse, and we went back and forth of how do we like get people excited about our library space? So we came up with a concept called the Evolve Project. Um, and the goal of it was to build an environment so exciting and engaging that people desperately wanted to be part of it. Um, and so we're like, well, what, what kind of tech do we need? What kind of things do we do, do kids like? And so we came up with a design concept uh, that ended up looking like this. I should have found the original architecture drawings. Um, but we completely renovated the children's library and we were told, by industry experts, it would cost about half a million to do. And we're like, no, that, that's impossible. And my director uh, was very uh, good with, with like guiding folks. So she goes, Brian, you have a budget of $165,000, figure it out. I want you to do everything you have in your plan, figure out how to make that work. And so what I did, and Amanda alluded to it a little bit, that I partnered up with startup companies. So I went to consumer electronics shows, I, I followed Indiegogo and Kickstarter religiously. And anything new and exciting that popped up, I was like, yes, this is what I want to join. This is what I want to be part of. Uh, and so I reached out to these companies and I said, hey, would you be willing to donate your products to our library space? And the vast majority were like, we never even thought about selling to libraries. Sure, here you go. Uh, and so some of our first partners were Sphero and Little Bits and Tiggly Shapes. Uh, which are you know pretty well known within the library community, and we helped shepherd that conversation. Um, and so, this idea came up was we wanted to change the way people see libraries, uh, and in order to do that successfully, because uh, from what I know, libraries don't have money trees. We came up with the idea of like, building partnerships, and so I would go to a trade show and I would ask this very simple question that I encourage everyone else to do, and it's, how much does it cost you to market to X amount of patrons or your, your library group. So we had 20,000 patrons that funneled into our district. And so I said, how much does that cost? And most folks don't have a number offhand, some do, but then you can go, well, look, take that amount of money that it would cost you to market and provide it as a donation to our library from your products. So I know your products, you might charge hundred dollars. It costs you $50 to make. Um, and it costs you, you know, five grand to market to us, give us 50 of those products and everyone wins. And it worked super, super well. So this was the original Sphero ball. If anyone has ever seen it, I still have the original one in a glass case that I like hold near and dear to my heart because it actually what kickstarted a lot of these education conversations. So originally Sphero was designed as like an RC car. 
<laughs> excuse me, sorry, couldn't mute fast enough. So Sphero was designed as like an RC car for people to play with. And so we were like, well, let's see if we get people to play with this and get excited and amped up. So we went to the schools and we just drove it around the hallways and people came up to us and said, what are those? And we're like, oh, this is called a Sphero ball. You can come to our library and play with it. And most people, most kids are like, uh, libraries only have books. What are you talking about? And we're like, no, our library is doing all this new stuff. We have new tech, new gear, new gadgets, new gizmos. Uh, and our patron usage skyrocketed through the roof uh, because all these kids immediately from school come to the library to play with whatever new games and gadgets that we had. Uh, and we tested our theory very slowly. Uh, we got these two tables that you see on the left and right of this picture, the blue countertop at the touchscreen table from a company called Smart Technologies. Uh, we got one of them donated through a grant and another one was from Friends of the Library. Uh, we started with one, the Friends of the Library saw how many kids were huddled around it playing every day. So they were like, we need two. And so that's what we do as our, as our proof of concept. Will we get more patrons into our library space if we incorporate technology in a different way? And so we did this gesture-based computing so you can stand in front of a, a TV screen and just by moving your hands, you're able to paint. Uh, and we started slowly testing out these things. And then once we saw the adoption rate pretty successful, we closed the library down for three months. Me and my colleague, we took down drywall. We ran, we couldn't run electric because uh, it's a government building. So we had a, that was like the only expense was having a contractor run electricity. Uh, and we had people donate tons of stuff. Uh, Sphero donated swag like t-shirts and giveaways and extra products. Tigley did the same thing. Uh, and we even had a company called Siftio, uh, which is no longer around, uh, work with us too. As we were building, uh, kids thought that what we were creating was so impressive that for our grand opening, they had to wait outside days in advance, like you would for Black Friday sales. Uh, and I was like, no, you should be able to just walk right on in, but I like the enthusiasm. Uh, but we built all this hype up by having some of our products out in the, in the hallway, like our foyer of their library, uh, because there was concerns about people stealing stuff. So Sifio goes, well, hey, we'll just give you our products for free. And if someone steals it, we'll just replace it for you. Uh, but let's see what happens. Like we want, we want to experiment with you. And so we found people who were willing to experiment with us uh, and test things out. And so it got super, super successful. Uh, and then all these other startup companies heard about what they were, what we were doing because those startup companies that we're already working with would brag and like, oh, we're working with Brian at the Mokina Library. You should too. And so all these different companies started reaching out, wanting to work together, wanting to work together and figuring out like, what can we do in our library space? What type of curriculum do we need to develop? What type of programs and activities can be created through it? Uh, and so... I continued that process when I left the library and I built the Evolve project. Uh, and I went to a variety of trade shows. Uh, one year I went to CES and made people take pictures of I Love Libraries. So on the far left, uh, that's Paul. He's a, he's the former CEO of Spiro. The middle is uh, uh, the, the gal that created uh, Little Bits. And on the right is uh, the people that work behind the scenes at Modular Robotics. And so, all these folks came together because they all had the same passion that I did, that I wanna see libraries continue to evolve and make things better. And so I always tell people what, what we need help with, what we need to work together on. Um, there's tons of opportunities to do pilot programs. So there's new tech, new tech coming out every single day. And the cost to, so I was at a, a trade show once and I accidentally went into a room I wasn't supposed to. And this is a funny story. Uh, so in this room is all the executives of Leapfrog, Toys R Us, like all these big wigs. And it was supposed to be like a meeting upon the like the brilliant minds that run these big toy companies and education companies. Um, so I like, I just hopped on in, like they had a, what I thought was fruit juice from a water spick. It was actually sangria. So that, that was, that was wild. I didn't know sangria tasted good until that time. So I'm right. drinking this juice. And I'm like, <laughs> I was wow, this juice is making me like sleepy and tired and dizzy. What is this? I'll get more. Um, and all these folks are talking and they were mentioned uh, about how it's very, very expensive 
for R and D for a new product. So if somebody has a new product idea and they want to see how it works in a community, it's super expensive because you have to pay all these project managers, you have to pay the testers, et cetera. So keep in mind, I've had a couple of glasses of what I thought was juice. I just raised my hand in the middle of this presentation and because really a panel discussion and I saw a few other people interject. So I'm like, raise my hand. And they're like, they look at me and they're like, who the heck is this kid? Uh, they're like, you? And I was like, have you thought about using libraries to pilot? It wouldn't cost you a dime. You call up a local library, say, hey, we have a company in your area that's building a new product. Would your library be willing to product test it and write everything up for us and how it works? They would do that for free, you know, like they would love that. And uh, then, then they're all looking at each other like, how come we haven't thought of this? And they're all like discussing it. And then they pause and they're like, first of all, who are you? And like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I don't know, the door was open and I saw people chatting and I'm like, oh, I like tech companies or toy tech. So I sat down and they're like, oh, and then like afterwards, like the lady running and she's like, hey, you know, this is like a private thing, but love to have you for next year as well. And I got like an inside scoop of how like some of these things work. Uh, and so I always tell people like, just ask, like you don't need the fruit juice to make you confident. Uh, just ask people like, hey, is it possible to do this? Uh, would you be willing to try? Um, and so then through that, you share stories of what you've accomplished, what you're planning on doing next. Like this is what you can do as an individual library. And it takes no like technical training at all. No, like you don't have to, you have to be slightly outgoing. You have to be willing to like ask for things, but it's super simple. And then I always share the story of how libraries are very instrumental with collaborating with the community. Like we are a community anchor. Like we know everything going on in the community and we know how to reach out to our fellow community members to make things happen. Uh, but to that point, I worked with a group once to get furniture for a library and we had a, a budget of zero dollars. So I was like, hey, open up the phone book and start calling all the local businesses around your library and say, hey, could you donate 50 bucks? We wanna buy a couch that's $200 or whatever it was. Uh, and so as they're calling folks, uh, one store guy was like, oh, wow, like I've always, I love your library. I didn't know you needed money. I'll just buy the entire couch that you want. Like, just tell me which one it is and I'll go buy it. Um, so they got this couch then for free and all they had to do was pick up the phone and ask. And so that's like a big, big thing for me. So shifting gears a little. So I've been doing the makerspace tech for, I want to say like 10 or 15 years now it's been a while uh and like teaching kids how to code how to do stem stuff uh all the things that amanda promotes within her tech kits uh and so then i was so then i partnered up with this company called Mindcare, and what they do is they create technology for people with alzheimer's or dementia or other like learning challenges and i'm like that's a huge area that we're missing i think in some of our library spaces like like, like from the tech nerd that I am to pause and go, well, actually like we're missing this whole group of people like fancy new tech isn't always the best for both Alzheimer's or dementia. And so through that, I've been doing a bunch of research and reaching out to a variety of different groups of how can we build, like build maker spaces, but what other spaces should we design? Uh, and so through these conversations of talking to folks with ADHD or dyslexia or any other learning challenges or differences, came up with this concept called a serenity room. And so my new idea that I'm floating around to the world is what should a serenity room be? Uh, like we would want something low tech, low, like high, like new things and more stuff to make you feel calm and comfortable. Because if you are afflicted with any of those uh, learning challenges, it's really hard to adjust to something brand new and flashy or too many buttons. And so, in working with Mindcare, we came up with a few products that would work really well in what we're calling a serenity space. Uh, things like an Alexa without the confusingness of an Alexa. So they've created an alarm clock that you can talk to and send reminders and, and things like that. And you can have it programmed in your own voice. Uh, and you can also use Google, Google Kit to build your own. Another big thing that we found through study is wall clocks can be hard to read. Like the, the brand new ones with the giant digital screens might not be comfortable for folks that grew up seeing these types of clocks. 
And so, like, what should we? What else should we incorporate in in these serenity spaces? <coughs> uh, so, I love that wall clock with the date on it too. Why isn't that a standard? <laughs> right. Yeah, it's 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 very inexpensive and it's simple to do and it's easy to install. Like you don't have to check with IT to do it. Like you just buy it and mount it on the wall. Um, maybe facilities, but it's a it's a very turnkey solution. Mm -hmm. uh, or a white noise machine. You can get one for like twenty bucks and that's mm -hmm. my safety room. So they actually talk about they actually created videos of like like waterfall so you can watch a waterfall if you will on a tv with the sound and everything mm -hmm. um you can easily do that with youtube if you wanted um but just having that play like brings that tranquility uh one of the other things that folks talk about is pets so how do we get pets in the library without having the barking and the meowing uh or the things that come out from the other side and so what they've figured out, I'm gonna go back and forth here, is uh, they have it, they call it a meta dog and a meta cat. Uh, and you can actually like talk to it and say, raise your head and the cat will raise his head. Uh, the breathing dog is supposed to help you if you have anxiety. The breathing rhythm is at a tempo that helps you calm yourself down. So when you hold it, it's tempo, your heart rate will match because of finger pressure, I don't know the science, but then your 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 heart rate slows down, your anxiety dissipates um, through these types of things. And so you could, in theory, have pets in the library, albeit a little robotic, sometimes a little weird, um, but caregivers in particular that do like nursing homes and stuff, uh, use what's called pet therapy uh, mm -hmm. to introduce how to be responsible or how to help people like jog memories or be calm in a relaxed space. They even have realistic dolls so you can like take care of a baby without having a, an actual baby in your library. Um, but there's a bunch of really positive outcomes that come through a variety of studies about using pets. Um, but this is one way to get into that. And that's good. There are lots of libraries that do bring in um, um, therapy dogs. We've had people on the show mm -hmm. about that for like actual real dogs, so, <laughs> not, not these. But I always wondered about that um, because of so many people, to some people having allergies yeah. that, I mean, it's a great thing for the people that can do it, but what about the ones that have the severe allergy to the dog or, or libraries that have a library cat, which is a, a common thing too, which is always fun to the cat lives here sure um but this would be a great way to not have to worry about that aspect as well yeah absolutely I've seen a library turtle <laughs> See? Oh, yeah i have seen libraries of turtles and fishes yeah <laughs> Good old they don't like it too much <laughs> yeah those uh, were at well, ala right yes yeah we had them at ala oh, wow. cool. uh, and then to change gears a little bit uh they say that for people with anxiety or memory recall challenges, having things like a busy board, which is this is kind of considered a busy board with locks, switches, gears, motors, et cetera, that you can tinker and play with helps jog memory and or reduce anxiety in a stressful situation. So it's almost like a fidget spinner on steroids, if you will. If they had like a noiseless click pen, I would be clicking that like all the time. <laughs> I'm a clicker. I like, the, I like the pens with like the multiple ink colors and trying to shove all of them out the same yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. Because they're awesome. Yeah. Uh, or even doing things, like, these are called fiddle mitts. Uh, and so the idea is that you put your hands inside this like fiddling area and you can fidget in private. Uh, and there's a variety of different sensory stimulation gadgets <laughs> that you can incorporate that helps reduce anxiety or depression. Uh, or even like, you know, I have fidget toys on my desk. Uh, so I'll play with fidget stuff, but you can't see me playing with it because the camera's neck up. But really I'm here just playing around, but in a in-person room, it's kind of obnoxious. I'm spinning this uh, in my lap. So this will help you, you know, still be able to fidget and whatnot without people noticing. And they're very easy to clean um, and it helps build this like engagement. So how do you set these things up? So very similar to the idea of circulating robots or tech kits you can do the same things with these types of devices uh, but you would probably change the loan period a little bit longer because you need to uh, so let them borrow them for for a month 
uh, or provide instruction cards. There's also the concept of uh, the cost of nursing homes are so expensive for people that are afflicted with memory challenges that usually it falls along the lines of like their, their children that have to take care of them. And so there's this undue tax going to caregivers that they don't have a resource to support them. Uh, and so using the library to support the caregivers as well as those other individuals, you've opened up your library space to a whole bunch of new ideas. So this is something I'm like pretty passionate about and excited for uh, seeing that I've now discovered I have family members also afflicted with these things. And so I'm like, well, yeah, libraries need to do this because I think everyone has a story of where they know someone that has Alzheimer's or dementia or other types of memory challenges. Sad but true. Yeah. So a couple other like engagement ideas. Um, I was what, for a cat. What's that? I was hoping there'd be at least in one more cat. There's always cat memes. Yeah. Um, but I think learning other languages is, is another big piece that, or even sign language can be a, a really good program for uh, older adults. Uh, they're looking for things to do. They might not be that interested in learning how a drone flies, but they might be interested in traveling in VR or traveling in, uh, or, or learning other languages. Hmm. Uh, a couple other like activities that aren't tech at all. Uh, so this is called Call to Mind uh, and it's a conversation game. Uh, it's especially really good for like library visitors and especially those with dementia to play like engagement games um, to get the memory going and to like spark interest in new things. And again, this is another activity that you can bring both the caregiver and the person afflicted. For the group that can't do cards against humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a ball that you would throw and catch. And when you catch it, however your thumbs land is the question you answer. So it's like an icebreaker activity. <coughs> um, so it's, it's, it's a very neat way to even bring other cultures in and other groups of folks to share what they do as like an enrichment activity. And similar to the, um, the soccer ball looking thing, this is a pair of dice that you would basically roll and then pull a card from uh, designed to help like shake loose a memory uh, and triggers like new conversations and new uh, ways to engage. Can be awesome, might open a can of worms. It could be, but yeah. it's always fun. Gotta try it, call it a pilot. Uh, and so I think the goal of libraries has always been empowering independence. And this is a new phrase that I've decided I would like to use. Uh, so I think libraries are good at empowering independence and we should figure out ways to do more of it. Uh, and what I mean by empowering independence is we provide curriculum or, or circulation items like books and, and movies and things like that that will teach people stuff uh, or give them access to things they ordinarily don't have, therefore making them more independent. Uh, or showing them how to program or code or use Office or use Excel, uh, learning about smart home devices or mobile apps. I think if we look more about how we can empower people to be self-sufficient, I think we can do a lot more good to the world uh, on that focus. Love the feline innovation there. Go straight to the source. Yeah. That's insane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then in terms of programs that I think we should start looking at is we're, again, I mentioned like the idea of caregivers. Uh, it's really hard to be a caregiver uh, for folks. Yes. And so I think <laughs> running programs that educate people, even if like they don't have to worry about that yet, they may have to eventually. I think, again, giving them that independence to know there's a resource they can go to and collection and curriculum and uh, resources, information, online databases, et cetera. There's a bunch of information at our fingertips that I think we can use to more focus on that initiative. Because as always, libraries are filled with books. And so I think if we give people more of those things and start empowering people to do more, I think that would be uh, widely helpful. So that's, so that's my thing about the Evolve project. And I'll change gears a little bit and talk about a few other things that I've been working on over the years um, to give people some context and support. So 
so for me, I always like to find ways because I've, I've again I've been in libraries since I was a small child. Um, and I want to see libraries continue to grow and be successful. One of the challenges that exist is the idea of hosting content. Um, so building websites. It's often pretty expensive to host a web page. And so I worked with Amazon uh, and we figured out a way to design a platform for libraries in particular to leverage or librarians if they want their own blog space uh, that we called LibTalk. And so the goal of it is to provide a very inexpensive space to host your library web page or a personal blog. And then what we decided to do since we're, we got a, a decent sized grant uh, to give newly graduating or graduated librarians free web space. Uh, so if you go to our webpage, libtrock.com, you can sign up for a free like web hosting package and we'll even get you a domain and everything um, because we want to see people be successful and share stories and share ideas. Uh, and so we always encourage people to reach out to us uh, and build those things because we feel that it's important. And then at the same time, I like to play in the, I'm a, I code only if I have to. And so there's a bunch of other opportunities um, such as like we, we wanted to make AI more accessible. Paying $20 a month is a little excessive, we think. And so we built our own AI tool that leverages some of OpenAI's ChatGPT framework. Uh, so you can create images, uh, translate audio, you can convert text to audio or audio to text using Amazon. And we did all the heavy lifting. So you literally just fill out a box and it makes it for you. Um, and so what, we, what, we, what we've been doing is giving people free access through a 30 day trial. Uh, and then if you need more time, you just message us and then it extends. Uh, there are limits because we don't want people to take advantage of the system and make like thousands of images. So we do have some thresholds that we try to make sure we don't exceed because then it'll be very expensive to run. And we're doing it all for mostly for free. Uh, with a few paid subscribers that will that help funnel the the free use um so that's our ai tool um it's a pretty fun one i've used it yeah yeah and i think and so like my goal has always been providing act opportunities whether in the ai space to make things a little bit more safer and <laughs> enjoyable um because obviously if i'm doing it i'm not collecting anyone's data like i have zero desire to do so uh and so there is it's, a, it's safer in that regard uh, because at least there's a name with the face. Uh, whereas there's thousands of people at OpenAI or, or other uh, that you may not know. And so what we wanted to do is provide a platform where you can play without like worrying that your data is going to appear somewhere else. Um, you can avoid the dirty, dirty data mongers. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't care enough. And also it's expensive to host and contain all that data. So like, I don't want to pay for it. So uh, away <laughs> it goes when you don't need it anymore. Uh, and then lastly, uh, one of the things that I've been uh, working with lately uh, is a company called Biowater Solutions. And so I want to talk a little bit about open source software really quick and then open it for questions. And we can talk about anything along that, that pathway. So my entire trajectory has always been trying to find resources and solutions for people uh, that like don't hurt the bank and don't like make you go broke because the more money you spend on something is less money you can spend on your community. And so that's why I've built the Evolve project to find partnerships that give out free tech. We built the hosting website to give people opportunities for cheaper hosting. And Bywater has been doing this really great uh, open source solutions for, I think, I think 50, their 15 year anniversary is coming up. So high level about open source. Um, oops, come on. There we go. Uh, there are like a lot of myths like, oh, open source is insecure because people can see the source code. And that's not entirely true because uh, usually with an open source framework and a platform, there's a bunch of people looking at it and making sure it goes through all the necessary checks and balances. Um, tons of support opportunities. Uh, and in order to change code, there are a lot of approvals needed uh, to do that before it goes live. Uh, so here's a couple of products that Biowater supports and encourages people to use. Uh, Koha is your integrated library system. If you've never heard of Toha, check it out. It's very clean, it's pretty, uh, and super, super easy to use. Uh, I haven't used an ILS in, since I was at the library. I had to use Sierra, I think it was, from, mm -hmm. what is that, Triple I Innovative. Uh, and so this is a thousand times easier in my opinion. 
Uh, they even built an open source discovery layer called Aspen that allows you to search for content a lot easier. Uh, kiosk management system called LibKey. And so if you're doing like PC reservations or print control and you're paying for like a, a license system, LibKey is open source and free. And then I recently discovered Metabase. And so I'm a big data nerd. So all my decisions I always make, I, I leverage data to do it. Uh, and so I've used tools like ThoughtSpot or Google Data Studio, all of which come with some level of cost. And it's kind of expensive to like put your data on there and then let it power through. Uh, so as a huge lover of ThoughtSpot, um, which is incredibly expensive, Metabase basically does the exact same thing. Um, and so check out like ThoughtSpot and be like, wow, I love how it makes those reports and generates graphs and charts, et cetera. How do I do that without paying a billion bucks? Metabase. Um, and so I'm always a big fan of using and leveraging open source software as well, uh, because it just, the, the unlicensed aspects of like my server infrastructure, if you will, from Libchalk is all open source. So that's why we don't have to charge as much uh, because we don't have a licensing stack that we have to worry about. Uh, it's just the data traffic that Amazon charges uh, is what we build back. So I should have left enough time, cool, for questions, answers, little discussion. Uh, hopefully I didn't wanna make it like salesy. So I, I wanna give you a cool arc of like things that exist out there in the library world. Uh, and I encourage people to like play. Um, it doesn't cost you anything to try something out is my big belief in life. Uh, you simply just ask people to like, hey, I don't wanna spend you know, $1,000 on a product. Can I borrow and get a copy of it and play with it? And I can ship it back if you want. Uh, and most people are very okay with that. And so if there's nothing that you've learned today, except that of just asking, then I feel like it's been a successful day for you. So I will, my email is shared. So you can always email if you're watching the recording, uh, but we'll open it up for general discussion, I guess. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, go ahead and leave your slides up there. So in case anyone wants to pop back to anything, and we'll have that up on the screen too. Yeah. Um, if anyone does have any questions, comments, thoughts, anything you want to ask Brian about or share about any of these things you've used in your libraries, we'd love to hear that too. Uh, type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I'm monitoring that here and I will grab your questions um, for Brian. Um, tabby or not Tabby? Yes. Why not both? That's my answer to that question. <laughs> um, I guess my first, like one question that I had, and actually one that I get a lot, is libraries that want to build out courses that are available through the library. Like they want to do the digital skill courses, life skill courses. And I think LibChalk actually has like the course component. And because I know like versus Niche Academy, which is like 10K a year. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how LiveChalk does the course stuff? Yeah, so what we've done, so again, I like open source. So there's an open source platform called Canvas. Uh, so Canvas from infrastructure has a closed model that's a software as a service you can pay for, they host and they manage. And then we have another version of Canvas that we've created over the years that you can upload your own content to. Um, and we don't charge like a licensing fee, we just charge the data behind it. Um, which is considerably less expensive. And so, uh, again, that's like a really cool thing about like the open source infrastructure frameworks is the recurring costs for like student licenses, if you will, or teacher licenses are very expensive. It's like a very lucrative business. The more popular your course is, the more money it costs you. Uh, and I don't, in my belief system, I don't think that's right. I don't think you should charge more for your popularity, but just because it, it's not really doing anything different. So resources might change slightly, um, but at the end of the day, the cost of that is, is insignificant. Most of your cost is on that data piece uh, or the bandwidth piece. And so I think using, so we use a tool, LibChalk uses a tool called Canvas. Uh, so if you don't know how to set it up yourself, be more than happy to show you, uh, or we can spin you up your own version of it uh, that you can play in. Is, I know that like in-house we use Moodle, but it's like yeah, Moodle's open source too. Yeah. 
Yeah, we use Moodle um, for a lot of our courses, our basic skills classes, but we're also um, expanding out into Niche Academy now. Nice. Um, yeah. For more um, self-paced courses. Uh, tried yeah. to do some self-paced, I think, in Moodle, but um, um, Holly Duggan, who's our CE coordinator, is experimenting now with Niche Academy, see if that's a better place to have some self-paced work in there. And it's like, I looked at the niche academy versus like i scanned through some of the resources for canvas and it's like it looks like niche academy you just upload a video and you can put some text with it and add some questions and it's pretty basic yeah and it's like for a cheaper rate canvas is pretty good mm -hmm. and if like if canvas can get integrated into a website seems it's a pretty decent option for libraries you have mm -hmm. to get started with it, absolutely yeah. So you go, large job. You go. <laughs> um, you talked about uh, Bywater and open source, uh, Brian. We actually, I, I am a huge supporter of, of them. Um, we've worked, well, we have a consortium here in Nebraska of libraries across the state. And I think they've got 12 or 15 libraries in the group now that have had a shared catalog for years and years called the Pioneer Consortium. Um, and they just, last year or the year before, uh, switched to Bywater, actually. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, they, they had been with something for a long time and um, uh, a different, it's still Koha, uh, but a different um, provider, I guess, of it. And they were not very happy at all. Um, and a few libraries had dropped out, actually, and gone uh, their own way. But they switched to Bywater and um, we gave them grants to help them to do that, actually, library improvement oh, grants beautiful. that happen. And they're though, so much happier, yes, definitely. It's like I uh, saw Koha and I remembered the Koha drama, and I was like, mm -hmm. "Buy water for the win." Yeah, yeah. they do great work. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that the, the Nebraska Library Commission puts on a ton of events and builds out grants and things for people to attend conferences or, mm -hmm. or move ILSs. I don't, I don't think too many groups do that these days. Uh, so keep up doing the the amazing work because it, it falls in line with the stuff that makes me excited and makes me passionate. Uh, which is like trying to extend what a library can do with its, its limited resources. Um, and so I think that's beautiful. We, we try. I wish we had more money. It would be nice if we had more, but we do with what we can with what we have. Yeah, giving people, we do continuing education grants to go to conferences too. Um, so that's a whole separate thing. Um, but for computers and libraries, we actually just have where, um, I guess, if, and we reach out to information today or they do to us and we offer a discount if you go through us kind of thing to just registration yeah. <laughs> and well, someone highly, from, um, from the consortium those, those conferences. Yeah. sorry sorry someone from the consortium i just mentioned the pioneer consortium is, is in the chat and said um now that they're with bywater it is a thousand percent better <laughs> oh nice so they're very happy um all right and we have someone who typed in a pretty long thing here let's see what a I've got here. Um, so everyone, we have um, at least 10 minutes left in our hour here. So definitely type in any questions you have. Um, and even if we go over, we'll just, we'll, anything you want to share about what you're doing in your libraries or anything, um, get it in and we'll make sure um, Brian or Amanda um, answer them. So um, let's see this. All right, so here's a, it's a, a long question comment here. Um, would it be untoward to create and have ready a library wish list, almost like a registry, with the tech materials or furnishings the library is aspiring to? I'm wondering if something like that would be helpful to have when people or groups the library might approach say, oh, we didn't know the library needed money. We could hook um, something up, but they don't even know what, as in your example. So come up with your ideas and kind of have a like you said, a registry or like, oh, people do an Amazon wish list. Kind yeah, of. I was going to say, I was going to say the Amazon wish list approach. I've seen a few libraries do uh, that works really well. Or even just putting a web page together that says, here's the things that we want to purchase and why and the cost. If you'd like to donate like a PayPal link uh, and then do it that way. That's low cost and, and quick and easy. If you don't like the, the Amazon monster, uh, yeah. you could do it that way. You can do a direct thing, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Definitely. Um, think of the, you know, wish list. If, you know, mm -hmm. if we had Smart. all the money that we could possibly have, what would we love to do with the library? And just put that out there, um, either on your website or when you are talking, you know, have some flyers or something or uh, a little half sheet, something you can hand out to. Some people want something they can take back to their organization or their group or their board of 
directors of whatever, um, or the company saying, hey, here's some of the things you'd want to do. Pick one and help us out doing it. Um, I think you would have to have, though, already planned who's going to implement the thing, whatever they the company picks to help you out with yeah. after, you know, once they say, yeah, we'd love to pick this thing fourth on the list. Make sure you have the resources and someone ready to jump in to whichever thing gets, you know, um, selected. You know, do that, do that prep work and planning ahead of time of if we had the money, who's going to do it, how's it going to happen? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And I think, Brian, you had an AI tool recommendation list. I think I remember seeing that floating around. Yeah. Uh, I'll throw it in the chat. Uh, let me grab my browser. It's one of those things that it's like, if you want to experiment with the cool, fun stuff, you also have to find out how much it costs and what the maintenance costs are. So it's like Brian tracks the trends, but if you want to build out a budget to, or, or like your wish list to find out what you want to get and when, yep, it can point you in the direction, then you can figure out what's in your budget. Yeah, if you go to links.evolveproject.org slash AI tools, it'll take you to that uh, Google Doc I have. Let's see if I can. Can you say that again? Links dot evolveproject.org slash AI tools. And we do have the general Evolve Project webpage linked off of our event page for today's show. I assume somewhere in there that would eventually get you there too? Uh, no, it's like a sh URL okay. shortener. Um, okay. But I, don't know. I put, we'll I put a couple links in the chat. Yeah, we will add that. That's right. If you already put it in there, I won't put it in again. I think I was only able to send it to the organizers. Yep, I got it. Yep. Same boat. Yeah. Oh, cool. Any other questions though? And can you flip back through? It's one of those things where I need like the memory trigger to get to the slide that made me think of the question. All right, I'll go back. <laughs> Any triggers? Um, I think I'm looking for the Serenity. Oh, the Serenity rooms? Let me zip over there. I also can't get the image of that weird looking muff thing out of my head. Because when I first saw it, I was like, what is that? And it looked like a cat that had been punched in the face, but then I looked at it closer and I was like, <laughs> oh, that makes sense. <laughs> you know? oh. So one other thing that I get questions from libraries about is, are there any like consultants or people who are able to help design specialty rooms like this? Mm. And I don't know oh. if you do that or if other people do that. Yeah, so the, the group that I've, I work with the most frequent is LFI, uh, Library Furniture International. Uh, they have a really great uh, designer on their team for like, because I'm not good at colors, like you tell me to paint, like it's white, white and gray, that's all you get from me. Uh, and you're lucky that I can like coordinate my outfits, like that's, that's extending it beyond my capabilities. Um, and so, yeah, LFI, Library Furniture International, has a great team uh, that does a really, really good job at helping you figure out what furniture to use, what colors, what design schemes, uh, et cetera. Uh, I, I personally think they're the best in the business. Uh, they've won a ton of different awards for libraries they've worked on. Uh, and they have the same philosophy as I do uh, of not like raking you over the coals for, for money. It's just, like more about like doing the best you can for the community's needs. I like it. The number one question we get is like recommendations for service providers. So I figured that question would come up. What was the name of that again? Is they have a website or, you know, yeah, URL? I'll find it really quick. It's LFI, Library Furniture International. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Put that in the chat really quick. Or, oh. you know, 
librayfurnitureinternational.com. Pretty, yep. uh, <laughs> pretty straightforward there huh. <laughs> for, for a website link. Easy breezy. Oh, they have those Lego to the Lego tables. My nephew would love one of those. Those are cool. Yeah. And then the other question that I get is, do you have an up-to-date list of all the gadgets you recommend on your website? Yeah, so when you go to my website, evolveproject.org, it's been a while since I went to my own webpage. That's embarrassing. I believe I have a link called Partnerships. Uh, if you click on that and scroll, the page should load. Uh, <clears throat> and it's all listed there. So you have like the punched in muff and the soccer ball and the uh no not those yet uh those will all be listed on a, on a different web page uh cool. eventually mostly just trying to find the spot where people can find this later yeah so let me get the link it's this one here I always wondered why GoToWebinar only lets the panel, the organizers and panelists email and chat to other organizers and panelists. And, and then, but I can, as an organizer, do to everybody. Yeah. What? I don't know. It's a weird lockdown that it, it's a restriction. Yeah. I would be happy to allow my, organ, my panelists and presenters to send things to everybody. Yeah. It's all right. Technology only works when you want it to. Yeah. All right. Well, all these links will be will make available also in um, uh, on the archive on the page, the archive page cool. when we do um, put this up. So, uh, let's go. Furniture and then the project one. It's like I also missed the blur feature from Zoom, but. Oh well, mm -hmm. that is one thing that it does not have yet. Yes, and I know there's been requests for it. And well, no. uh, let's not I'd talk. Like to submit it. that request. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Um, I am going to get uh, my screen up here now, so you can show. If anybody has any? You got another? We're almost at the top of the hour. Yeah. So if anybody does any have any last minute desperate questions or comments you want to share, type into the questions section. We got a thank you all. Thank you, Brian, Kristen, Amanda. You're welcome. Uh, um, this is a lot of great information as you, Brian. And Brian's been on the show before. Um, if you search on our show archives, you can look up his um, just look up his name, and um, you'll find previous sessions that he's done um, for us over the years. Also, I think Brian needs a nap and another cup of tea. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My throat's killing me. But uh, thanks for having me as always. It's always a blast to hang out with you folks. Yeah, of course. And share about everything, the new ideas, new things you're doing. Um, like I said, you you came to computers and libraries years and years ago. And I, um, I think I was at that same computers and libraries when you first came uh when you were first there uh if if uh, um i remember correctly because i used to go to the conferences years ago too um with groups. to come back it's a blast yeah uh, i do a lot of the virtual stuff now too so yeah yes. um and so it's great to hear you have the new things you have going on so it doesn't look like anybody's typing anything yet um but if you do reach out to brian on his website or with his email if you do want to chat with him about anything else um, and we've got our links here. Here's a link we have to the Evolve Project website, the AI tools specifically um, list that he had, and that um, uh, Library Furniture International for um, help with uh, designing your areas. Um, and I will link add these links to the session page here when I put the archive up. Cool. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here. So um, I should have the archive ready, the recording ready by the end of the day tomorrow at the latest. Um, anyone, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me, we do post our recordings onto our um, YouTube channel for the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show get an email directly from me 
um, when I also send it out to our mailing list here in Nebraska. We also push out onto our social media. We have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you'd like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. Um, we have, here's a reminder about last, um, about this week's show, um, when the recording is available, we also um, post um, that up here as well. And we use the hashtag Encump Live, a little abbreviation on our Twitter and Instagram. So if you wanna just look for that hashtag, um, if you use any of those particular um, services. Uh, I'm going to go back to our main page here and show everyone. Here's our upcoming shows, um, but I want to show you where our archives are, are right here underneath. There's a link to the archives. Most recent one goes to the top of the page. So today's will be up there by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, and as I have, we'll have a link to, um, oh, Brian, if you send me your slides or a link to your slides, I can yes. link to those as well. And then all the other links will be added in there along with to our uh, YouTube archive as well. And while we're here, I will show you um, you can search our show archives to see if we've done a topic on something of you, you may be interested in. You can search the full show archive or just the most recent 12 months if you want something just current. Um, and that is because this is our full show archives and I'm not gonna scroll all the way down. If you look at the scroll bar over here, you can see it's very tiny. Um, this is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January, 2009, which means this is 2024 is the 16th year of, our, of the show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Every time I say that, it just blows my mind. That's amazing. That's really awesome. I, I started this out as just something to do every week to help libraries learn things, um, to, sh to share what they're doing um, with um, what libraries in Nebraska are doing outside and to bring into Nebraska what's happening outside the state. Um, but now people from all over the country attend and um, present and, and I love it. Yeah, we'll keep going as long as we've got topics to to talk about, which I think we will. Um, and good but, times were had by all. Yeah, but if you do watch an old show, pay attention to the original broadcast date. Um, they all have the date when they first happened. Um, some shows will be great and good to watch and stand the test of time, but some things will become old and outdated. Resources and services may have changed drastically or no longer exist anymore. People may work at different libraries or different organizations than they did, and links may be broken. We do not have, we have, over, I don't know how many recordings we have from here now, five, seven, 600. Um, we don't have the capacity to go back and fix links regularly, so just do pay attention to that. And just for an example here, if you type in Brian's last name, you can see how often he's been on the show going all the way back to 2012 when you first came to talk about the Evolve Project. And a few of your CES, CES, yeah. Yeah. Brian of yesteryear. <laughs> Baby Brian. Yeah, there's a video there. Go ahead and take a look at it if you want. <laughs> All right, so I think we'll wrap it up for today's show then. Um, as you can see right now, there is nothing on the schedule yet for next week. I'm still working with some people to see if we can get somebody on. Um, if not, we may take a week off. We do that every now and then. Sometimes you just need um, take a take a little break. Um, but we do have other dates filled in for March and April. Um, and as usual, um, I've got the end of March pre-suite tech on there. I'll get April's there as well if you wanted to. Um, lock that in and get your registration in for whatever Amanda has for us next time and see. I might awesome. try to get the CIL recap in. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because yeah. um, that would have been a couple of weeks before. Yeah. yeah. By the 20, by the 27th. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So thank you everyone for being with us. Hopefully you'll join us on a future episode. Good to you. See you, Brian and Amanda. Hope you feel better, Brian. Take care of yourself. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye. More tea. Yeah. Bye. All on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>